Hello, so uh, welcome all. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to have David uh, Archer uh, talking again today. In fact, this is going to be one of a, a three-part uh, presentation. Um, the title of the talk is, is basically using Python R Dynair to create a structured uh, projection and policy analysis system. Uh, David is going to spend most of his, his time talking about what is a structured uh, projection and policy analysis system. And what I'm going to do, uh, and this is very much related to our summer courses uh, to central bankers trying to uh, show them how to exploit the, the power of, of programs like Python and R for surveillance activities, but, but also how to use Dynair uh, for solving very interesting uh, policy problems that we're facing uh, right now uh, with US policies uh, that look like we're going to significantly overshoot uh, the target and thinking about those kinds of issues. Now, David and I are gonna talk specifically about those kinds of issues uh, next week uh, where we talk about uh, Fed policy and, and, and what we think would be a better way of, of, of organizing these discussions and communicating them. Uh, and these comments are going to be, I think, uh, relevant to all central banks, David, right? So it's not like we're, uh, the advice that we're giving about how it would be organized at the Fed would be different than other countries. So we think it's They're exactly that. right. That's right, David. Don't. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and then the other parts is, is kind of like motivating um, an overshooting scenario. And what we're going to be using is open source software just to show uh, some of the data uh, that I've been looking at uh, and people at the Better Policy Project have been looking at to monitor uh, what's going on in the U.S. and, and uh, you know, literally on a, on a daily basis. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's start. Um, so we're going to sprinkle in some Python and some R. And then next week, a little bit of Dynair into, into something that looks like a pretty formal presentation. But obviously, uh, the COVID uh, shock uh, is front and center uh, in terms of the construction of any forward-looking framework uh, at this point. And so this is an example of, of how we've used both R and Python to to design a report for macroeconomists that want to understand things like scales and effectively uh, the battle between the vaccine uh, and the virus. So this is trying to put the whole story together in one page of charts. Uh, the first page is, and these are updated every day at 5, 5 p.m. Uh, Lisbon time. Um, so the first chart is basically the daily new cases. Um, this is looking at data uh, for uh, the United States. And so we can see that, uh, that obviously um, the vaccine has been winning recently. New cases are down uh, substantially. Uh, we also have death rates. So these are new deaths, a blue line, uh, as well as a, a measure of uh, seven day moving average. This, the red line. And so you can see, despite the fact that Delta has been causing some issues, it hasn't shown up uh, in deaths uh, or hospitalizations. And so if you look at the aggregate hospitalization rate, which is the blue line, it's still at uh, pretty, pretty low numbers. So the vaccines have been working against the Delta variant and, and obviously that's good. The death rate has been plateauing. Uh, that's just a sign that the daily death rate has gotten very, very low. And as a result, um, basically government stringency measures have, have come down substantially. And so this is the big issue uh, is, uh, is the U.S. going to open, uh, you know, with a, with a time of exuberance and people spending a lot this summer and and over the, the second half of this year, 
or is it going to be a more cautious increase in spending? And so we're looking at things like the balance sheets of, of, the, of the household sector. Uh, one particularly interesting fact that's a part of our surveillance reports is obviously the, the numbers that are published by the Fed on the household balance sheet. And if you look at checkable uh, deposits in cash uh, from 2019 uh, to up until the end of the, the first quarter of this year, uh, they've accumulated an additional uh, $2.3 trillion in cash. So there's money that's basically sitting there ready to be either spent uh, or ready to be uh, invested in real estate or other financial uh, assets, uh, or there's money to be saved potentially uh, because of precautionary motives and so on. But how much goes to spending in the short run is gonna influence obviously what happens uh, going through the summer and, and the near term and so on. And this is just daily vaccination rates. They went way up to 1% of the population per day. Uh, and then since then, uh, they've come down to about 0.3, uh, which, is, which is actually quite disappointing. Um, the, the positive news is that if you look at the proportion of the population that's fully vaccinated, it's well above the 40% mark, which is the share of the vulnerable population. And so this is why we're not seeing an increase in the death rate and the hospitalization rate in response to this, this new more infectious uh, Delta variant. Uh, this is just looking at daily tests. Now, the other interesting thing about the package is that it has uh, Google mobility data. So these are, data about how much activity there are about around retail and recreational uh, establishments. So you see it was really affected, obviously, uh, during the lockdowns in the first wave. Uh, and then, of course, there were some other lockdowns in the in the second wave, and obviously it suffered as well. But you see it's really been coming back, you know, quite strongly. Uh, and if you look at the latest numbers, it's actually uh, ticked up some more. So we're looking at this and things like credit card purchases to to monitor kind of like the high the very high frequency movements about how much demand might be hitting the uh, the US market now and so on that note uh, I think David is going to talk um, not just about uh, what the benefits of uh, this projection and policy analysis system are uh, but sort of his experiences uh, as a developer of these things, um, as well as a user of these things. Uh, so he's been both uh, a user and a, and a policymaker. Uh, and now that he spent all his time at the BIS, he's obviously got a sample of many countries' experiences to be able to draw upon. So I'm sure it will be an interesting uh, presentation. David, you ready? I'm prepared. To yeah, thanks. Thanks, Doug. So I met Doug um, first way back when I was at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the economics group there. Um, this was uh, not long after we had uh, been given an inflation targeting mandate with independence to pursue that mandate. But uh, uh, what we didn't have at the time was many of the tools which are necessary to understand the character of the problem that we were confronting. Well, Doug and some colleagues came in to help us develop a, a new forecasting model, a new projection model, uh, and one which had the key characteristic of having endogenous policy, policy built into the model structure. So for the first time, we were, start, we were able to explore the implications of the sorts of shocks that were happening, might be happening, could happen to the economy in terms of their implications for policy. So for the first time, really able to start to do uh, policy risk analysis and start to think about um, 
questions about how rapidly to respond to different forms of shocks, what were the likely dynamics of the policy path under different scenarios. So it was a dramatically um, substantial step in our capability. And that's the essence of the benefits of having a structured system within which policy is, um, is endogenized in a systematic way. So you can trace through where things are coming from. You can ensure consistency, not only within the structure, but consistency over time. I can recall many occasions where before we had such a structure, people would slip and slide from one meeting to the next in terms of their thinking about what was going on and the implications of what was going on because there was nothing to control that process of uh, making up a story without uh, ensuring the consistency in the storyline from period to period. So that's the backdrop to wanting something which is a structured model-based endogenous policy inclusive system. So the policy goals we have when we're trying to um, when we're trying to do policy are uh, twofold. Uh, basically, we're trying to make whatever choices we're, we're thinking about today and making today consistent with what we're trying to achieve, and that's going to be in the future as slags involved. And we're going to want to communicate the logic of the choices in terms of our thinking through the dynamics and thinking through the lag structures and so on uh, to markets and to the wider public. So against that backdrop, we have some specific design goals for a policy, a predictions and policy analysis system, a PPAS. Now, for those who are used to a different sounding acronym, FPAS, just hold that um, intrigue as to why uh, there's a shift from FPAS to PPAS just for one slide. So uh, what are our PPAS design goals? We've got limited resources uh, within the economics group, and we need to focus those, uh, use them effectively in um, the pre preparation of the choice uh, that the policy maker is going to need to make, the assistance that we're gonna give the policy maker. In course of doing that, we wanna put policy risk identification right at the very center of the work that we're doing. And I'll explain why that's the right way of thinking about it. It's a bit of a migration of our thinking, but it's, I think, the, the right way of thinking about it. It harks back a bit to Greenspan, uh, his um, argument or his characterization of policy as a risk policy risk management game. Um, I think we should take that suggestion very seriously. In doing this, we want to produce uh, uh, current analysis and policy scenarios, and we want to integrate those. We want to integrate those in a coherent way. So that's the third of the design goals. Doug, your finger is a bit slack here. You need to be touching the button to move this. That's great. And fourthly, we want to uh, not only improve our own understanding, uh, of what's going on in the policy alternatives, the policy scenarios that we have in front of us. But we want to be able to communicate that externally as well as internally. So we have these four design goals for our PPAS. Now, why I said, let's just hold, wait for the uh, question of why PPAS and why not FPAS. FPAS is a forecast and policy analysis system. The inherent problem that we've learned about, and the Fed is learning this uh, very strongly uh, in recent years as it's made uh, very obvious forecasting errors. And we've all, we all make major forecasting errors all the time. The problem is that macro models have never been good at forecasting. And so thinking about developing uh, our, our systems and our methods and our processes around something which we are not good at is inherently problematic. Now models can help, 
Um, but it's the people who ultimately make the forecast. And especially when you think about the launching point for the projection into the future, that what's, what's happening currently. That's where uh, people expertise comes to the fore. But people don't have crystal balls. So we cannot see into the future. Uh, so if you get um, if you get a forecast and compare a forecast versus predictions, uh, if you ask somebody what their forecast is for, say, inflation, uh, next slide, thanks, Doug. The answer is likely to be, well, you know, it's going to be two percent because what else could I say? Um, if you instead ask in terms of uh, what's your projection you're gonna get a much richer discussion and a much more uh, important discussion for thinking through what the character of the policy problem is. Um, to be sure, people are important, but people with a framework and a structure and useful tools are more important again. So against that background, um, Let's think about the evolution from forecast systems to policy and prediction systems. We've all had forecast systems. Bank of Canada had a staff economic projection for years. Uh, the same in, in every central bank that I've come across with. There's a, uh, it's a, there's a system involved in, in bringing together current analysis, bringing together thinking through uh, uh, how things might evolve in the future. And in the middle of this is uh, some form of modeling with, or some forms of modeling with policy uh, endogenous to in that model. It's a consistency generating tool uh, that helps staff develop and policymakers discuss the alternative scenarios that they could be confronting. And there's always more than one possibility that needs to be considered. So it's uh, scenarios that they could be confronting. In this, the role of the core model is to uh, describe the interaction of the key macro variables as they uh, evolve over the, the medium term. Uh, next slide, thanks, Doug. Um, the, it, the, the model is there to provide a consistency check. I mentioned that earlier on uh, the judgment that people bring to the table that they apply to the uh, model structure. Uh, it's there to provide um, some way of handling the dynamics of medium term scenario, dynamics that you cannot do in your head. It's just simply not possible to just put these things together in your head. So the modeling is, is there to provide these consistency checks and enable uh, handling of um, dynamics, which give you a, a chance to understand the sorts of risks and the sorts of uncertainties that you're confronting or the policy decision maker is confronting. Now the model, as we've emphasized, does not produce a forecast. It produced scenarios of internally consistent paths, which are possible given the sorts of assumptions that you make about the dynamics of the economy that you've built, you've tried to capture in your modeling, and about the kind of shocks that you are perceiving in terms of the policy process um, or to the, the, um, to the economy which will enter the, in the policy process. So the, just to detail now a little bit more in, in terms of um, what the uh, structured PPAS looks like and the various steps involved in using such a system. And this is, uh, uh, about, I'm about to hand over to Doug to get into the first three of these elements. We'll defer the discussion of the last three of these elements until the next uh, the next presentation. But the, the overall system contains these six elements. You've got a set of databases and you've got reporting packages you develop to extract the information from those databases. You, you have a now casting system to try and get a handle on what's happening now that is not yet revealed in the official numbers, because the official numbers won't be here for 
some weeks, some months, even some quarters sometimes, and then they'll probably be pretty rough estimates that will update over time. Third element is you have uh, near-term updates of uh, what you think is going on progressively over time. Quarterly or thereabouts, you're going to run a set of projections, which puts a whole lot of structure on the forward paths that are going to be relevant to the decision maker. You're going to develop scenarios for the decision maker to consider. In the, in the policy decision, and that will involve risk analysis. So the first of these three, uh, where are we at right now? What do we think is going on? And in particular, which of the scenarios we've been talking about as real possibilities to think about in policy making, which of those scenarios look like they're the ones starting to play out? Because as we go through time and we look at the current data, we look at the arrival of information, we're going to get clues as to which of these various alternative paths into the future look to be the most likely ones that are happening right now. But at the same time, we're going to get clues as to other possibilities we haven't been talking about, which have become relevant to the policy risk analysis. So Doug, let me hand back to you so that you can pick up the discussion of the first three of these elements. Okay, just um, so I can draw a few things out here. Um, so we've been helping central banks, uh, starting with New Zealand, actually, when David was there, develop these forecasting and policy analysis systems. David wants to now change the emphasis um, uh, uh, so that we don't lose sight of what, why we want to construct forecasts. And, and the problem with just saying one number is an oversimplification that can, that I actually is uh, not good for the debate that we want to encourage and so on. Uh, the debate internally and of course the debate uh, externally. So, but I wanted to give some idea uh, because when you look at this, um, uh, particularly if you're a large central bank that's been organized a particular way, then it might seem a bit daunting uh, to, to try to do this um, and do it quickly and so on. So I just wanted to give an idea, David, about how many resources does it actually take to do this? Um, and, and is it more efficient or like, or is this an efficient deployment of resources in these central banks? But why don't you give us an idea of how, how, many, how many people are we, are we talking about here? Uh, well, we don't have to be talking about very many at all. Uh, when I was at the Reserve Bank, we were running with a team of about 15 in total, and that's a buff, roughly about the size that they still have. Um, you might think of, broadly speaking, about five people involved in model development, building the tools uh, that people are going to use and, and exploring these scenarios, exploring, uh, integrating current analysis with uh, an understanding of how things could evolve over the future. Uh, so you might think of five people involved in, in using the models to do this exploration and five people involved in uh, and providing the clues as to what's going on right now. Now, the, the, actually, we found that we were using a different distribution of resources and more resources in total in the previous arrangement where before we had decent model structures, we were trying to put together um, forecasts, analyses and forecasts based on sets of spreadsheets that people wanted to uh, run independently as sectoral experts and then have some kind of integration process which would be uh, circular in nature, iterative in nature as people updated a particular sectoral view or somebody updated their view of the supply side of the economy and everybody have to go back around again. So you would have we had fewer people involved in, in uh, model development and a lot more people involved in spinning the wheels uh, 
on developing sectoral detailed analysis. It turned out you needed a lot more just for the cumbersomeness of that process, but it also turned out you needed a lot more because uh, sectoral specialists wanted to show off and they showed off by getting into incredible detail in their sectors. And so you ended up with those massive reports of details here and there, which started to slip out into the policy communications. Stuff which is actually not core to the policy issues that the, the decision maker confronts. And really it's a way of um, providing ammunition for your critics to hit you with, because if you provide lots of unnecessary detail and that unnecessary detail is going to turn out to be wrong, it's very easy to identify that you were wrong. So it's actually a way of slimming down uh, the, uh, the total resourcing that you need, but you need different people. You need people who can understand macroeconomics as framed in a model structure, understand the issues around what are behavioral relationships and dynamics that you need to get your hands around. Uh, you need people who can uh, then integrate quickly the core of the current data stream uh, to extract from it the, the, uh, the clues as to what's really going on in the, in the economy, how other shocks really impact. Good. Um, okay, so um, so the point is we're we're experiencing this massive technology shock uh, where we're all going to be able to use open source software. And so as a part of this experiment of, of being able to do uh, what David is recommending that we do inside central banks, uh, we have tried to do it at the Better Policy Project with as few resources as possible uh, and probably with a few volunteers from from people in central banks that, that I'm going to mention later. Um, and so what I mean by that is that we've used a collection of Python and R programs for creating a system like a database system and some reporting packages, uh, as well as to do a little bit of now casting and, and so on. And so what I'm gonna do is just kind of show you uh, the kinds of reports uh, that we generate um, and update uh, other every day or, or when the data are, are released. Um, and so I thought I'd show you that part today, as well as this little report uh, that has uh, a linear uh, Phillips curve for the United States versus a convex Phillips curve for the United States, just to look at what the implications of different paths for uh, the U.S. output gap could mean for inflation from the perspective of a very simple um, reduced form representation of, of the inflation uh, process. Um, and so obviously this is a reduced form model. We have to understand, you know, what all the limitations are. But as Pablo uh, Garcia uh, taught us last week, um, one of the reasons why we look at models is that it forces us to think about things. Okay, so I'll tell you what all the assumptions are that, that go into um, uh, what precisely uh, it is we're trying to do here. Um, Okay, so can you see my can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, that's successful. Okay, so uh, first thing, can you see ingredients of a good central bank projection, not a forecast? Um, yeah, I the like first that. Question is, you know, where is the economy starting off? What are the underlying forces driving the economy? what do policy instruments, and we can think of it generally as monetary or fiscal, 
What do they need to do to achieve our basic policy objectives? And then of course, what if it doesn't happen? What are the implications of not adjusting uh, policies sufficiently aggressively to, to deal with situations? Uh, this this uh, framework that we're talking about, the PPAS framework, is going to have a suite of models. Okay, now in some cases, in some central banks, it'll, they might have two core models. Uh, so good examples of that are if the central bank is maybe a commodity exporter, so they'll need maybe something to do, think about terms of trade shocks and implications for the exchange rate. At the very same time, they'll need a very practical model that's sort of based on GDP and the GDP add up and so on. So sometimes they have two core models. There's also a lot of other models in the suite of models that, would, that I wouldn't describe as being core uh, macro models, like the one we're gonna be using next week when we actually get into some policy scenarios and so on. Um, but there are reduced form models um, that people love to look at uh, inside these policymaking institutions. And in fact, uh, it seems like everyone that I've been involved with uh, over the years always has their favorite uh, reduced form. Okay, so um, we want to allow for many other reduced forms. And so if you have something to contribute in this area, uh, consider this to be uh, just some work in progress and so on. So, but what I want to show you is, is basically how you, in this case, use R to generate this report that you're looking at it on the screen, which is going to have a little statistical work, um, looking at the connection between the US output gap as measured by the, um, by the CBO uh, and measures of core inflation, either from the CPI or, or from the, the PCE. So we're going to go through a, just an example of some little reduced form models, uh, their assumptions, and what implications they have for inflation, depending on how the US real economy plays out. And so the beautiful thing about a report, obviously, you have to have a table of contents that is, is going to be updated in a consistent way. Um, we start off with the dot plot, of course. And so this is the latest dot plot from uh, June 16th uh, of last month. And so you can see that the, uh, the forecast for inflation for this year has been revised up uh, substantially. So for example, if you look at at the old forecast uh, back in March, and we look at the range, you know, between low and high forecasts of the number, the current uh, forecasts of, of PCE and core PCE are well above, um, you know, what people thought the upper range was back in March. So there's been an enormous uh, surprise and we still have this scenario uh, where the Fed funds rate or these forecasts supposedly are based on a Fed funds rate that's effectively unchanged uh, and then starts increasing a little bit, uh, you know, at the, in through 2023. Um, and so the question is, you know, is this forecast for interest rates consistent with, uh, with a scenario um, where things might be stronger, uh, inflation expectations might shift up, uh, and so on. Uh, so that's really what the issue is. Now, what are we going to do here? Um, so in the full system, we would have a now casting system. Um, the Fed, uh, Reserve Bank of Cleveland actually has a little now casting system where uh, they actually monitor on a daily basis the, uh, the core uh, CPI and the core PCE, which are some variables that are going to be entering our little model. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the monitored values from the Cleveland Fed. Now, just if you're looking at the, at the chart at the bottom, uh, you can see that there are big, big inflation surprises uh, in the last few uh, inflation reads in the in the United States. Uh, and according to the Cleveland Fed's models, these were totally unpredictable increases. And that's sort of consistent with uh, what happened with the revisions in the dot plot. Um, and so it was revised up a lot for this year. And obviously these problems are assumed uh, in these dot plots to disappear over time. Um, Okay, so this is just estimating some regressions. So we're just going to estimate a regression that says that the year on year uh, measure of inflation, and we're gonna be trying using a core measure of inflation, either the PCE or the CPI. And we're just going to think of the reduced form as being a linear combination of what the target is. So if it's the PCE, it would be 2%. So pi star would be 2%. So it's gonna be a linear combination of that pi star and, and lagged inflation. In this case, the year on year measure of lagged inflation, um, as well as the output gap and the change in the output gap. Uh, here we're using CBO estimates of the output gap. And so you estimate that regression and you find that there's a, uh, coefficient on the lagged inflation term of, of almost 0.7. Um, the change in the output gap, uh, the coefficient on it is highly uh, statistically significant. And there's also a, a small level gap uh, term. So this is consistent with the view that, that basically the Phillips curve is very, very flat and there might be some speed limit effects. So that's the change in the output gap. And then of course we can compare that to a, uh, to a nonlinear model. And so this is on the second uh, part of it, the nonlinear CBO output gap, where we basically just scale the problem by multiplying it by five and dividing by five minus X, the output gap. And what this does is it makes the inflationary effects of excess demand start becoming more significant after the output gap gets into the 2%, 3% range. And then of course, if the economy is run very, very hot, something that would take the unemployment rate down to incredibly low numbers, then one would think as suggested by theory and tremendous empirical evidence during the 1970s, that there would be an inflationary response as the economy hit more and more capacity limits. So we have the nonlinear uh, version of the Phillips curve. It has a very similar property. Um, you can see 0.7 on the lagged inflation term, uh, a coefficient of about 0.1 on the change in the gap. So it's still there and with a coefficient of 0 0.07 on the nonlinear uh, output gap. Now you compare the two models directly and you'll see that they fit the data, the linear model and the nonlinear model fit the data about equally as well, okay? Or as badly, depending on what your perspective is, okay? But they have, they have almost the same R squared, okay? Um, so now let's look at the implications. And so we consider three scenarios. So just imagine a scenario where uh, we're thinking about not raising the Fed funds rate for some very long period of time, which seems to be in the baseline now. Now, if that were the case and inflationary pressures were to build up, that would mean that the real interest rate would be declining over time. And so this would be a, a source of additional monetary stimulus just by not raising the Fed funds rate if there's an inflationary impulse either 
influenced by a shift in inflation expectations or an expansion in demand. And what's special here is that we're likely to observe both of those things happening at the same time. So now this reduced form model is going to hold all that expectation stuff fixed because we're going to use the historical parameters where things were anchored and so on. And so we're, this is these calculations are going to embody the idea that people believe the system is anchored. So they're going to be quite small. So we consider three scenarios. One is where the output gap uh, rises to 1% excess demand uh, next year. So you can see that output gap in the middle column. You see the first scenario it rises to 1%. And then we can compare the predictions of the non-linear Phillips curve model versus the linear one. Okay, And you can see that it doesn't make much of a difference Okay, uh, if you have an output gap that's only 1% uh, higher Okay, than in equilibrium. Now, what happens for, for a situation where it could go to 2%? Now, the difference between the nonlinear model and linear model, it could be adding, for example, a couple of tenths uh, in the second year. Okay, so you can see that at the bottom, it's 2.8, the year on year PCE. And you can see that from the linear model, it, it would only be 2.5. So with an excess demand getting up to 2%, we would start to see these nonlinearities engage more. This is an example of the cycle getting up to as much as 3%, which I would argue is more likely that, that with over $2 trillion in cash ready to be spent, uh, there could be a tremendous boost in domestic demand <clears throat> as a result of that. So it's quite likely that we could get a scenario where the U.S. economy in terms of aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the goods market overshoots by, by 3%. But this was meant just as motivation for an open discussion of these issues um, that we wanted to start today. Uh, and then carry on next week. But David, do you have uh, any any remarks? Yeah, so I think right? one of the uh, striking things, and I hark back to your point that um, the empirical fit of these different reduced form models is kind of identical. Um, that there's there's always a great deal of difficulty and <clears throat> distinguishing between different hypotheses in terms of how we should be characterizing the behavior of the economy. I mean, a priori, you, you uh, might not be able to pick between these two things, but the choice you make, if you were to make a single choice, could be very significant in terms of the implications, as you've just demonstrated in the most simple, simple uh, experiment. So given that we don't have a way of distinguishing the two at the start, Presumably, we want to consider both possibilities and then start asking questions about what's the risks we're most scared of in the policy making process. So this is exactly why we want to be thinking about not a singular forecast, but consideration of the range of issues that might generate uh, alternatives that we might have to confront and the kind of policy risks associated with each of those alternatives. Um, okay, so I'm at this point going to turn it over uh, to people and I'm sure have lots of questions uh, for David, but while people are preparing their questions, uh, I, I think I'd like to have a little debate with them um, and in particular on this issue about how long should it take to produce a projection? 
like what would what like what um, how many days would you say it takes to produce an efficient projection? Uh, yeah, it's a difficult question, uh, and it's it. The answer is mostly in: Do you have people who are trained to work with model simulations? Because if you've got people who are trained to work with model simulations, you're talking about minutes uh, to. Um, actually run uh, a range of scenarios which are capturing the essence of the problem. Uh, it might take a little bit longer to um, think about how you would uh, evolve the model structure to, for example, start to deal seriously with the expectations, behavioral shifts that could go on endogenous to the process. So uh, as you said, you've got uh, in both of these reduced form scenarios, you've got anchored expectations. The expectations process itself is immutable to the two scenarios. So even if you really exaggerated things, and let's say it's like a 4% output gap shock, which will start to produce some really serious inflation consequences. And then by assumption, because you haven't allowed the expectations process itself to evolve, you're saying people won't care. They won't change their thinking. They won't even notice basically that there's been a, uh, such a departure from what they've been experiencing recently. To then treat that problem, because obviously you need to treat that problem, you need to think about that as a, as a serious issue. Uh, it might take some time, some work to work out how it is you're going to capture the endogeneity of the expectations process. You might say, well, I can't make it endogenous. I'm just going to have to be prepared to, uh, to have a, some kind of uh, a shock term, which will shift the, um, the degree of backwards looking nature as opposed to forwards looking nature or anchoring of the uh, expectations process. Once you've done that thought process and that thought process, what you work that, that kind of a problem through, it's going to be a whole lot faster with people who can think in model terms. Then the actual management of the scenarios is not a time consuming thing. It's all about the human capital and your willingness to think in these terms. So two weeks. Uh, yeah, well, I, I mean, faster if, if you've got the right people. Uh, most of the work is going to be involved in, in doing the now casting. Uh, if you're thinking about a policy uh, a forecasting round or a projections round where you're starting to build some scenarios, you're going to have some time involved in setting up the, uh, the, the baseline in terms of where you think the economy is at right now and discussing what does that mean in terms of what scenarios are you going to need to add to your suite of scenarios. Now, by the way, this is something I think we'll talk about a lot more as we go through the series of presentations that uh, over time you build up a capacity and a uh, kind of a logbook of scenarios and how you process different scenarios. So they'll be on the shelf available to uh, plug in. So it'll be relatively rapid as a process. Uh, every now and again, you're going to confront a situation which you haven't thought about at all, come into a pandemic, uh, that kind of the character of a combined supply and demand shock uh, like this is not something you will have on the shelf. That's going to take you more time to develop. But if you've, over time, you'll build a capacity to bring plug-in shock types, uh, shift the dynamics of the model around, pull out a model with a, a, certain, uh, a certain set of embedded dynamics that you haven't been using because they hasn't been that relevant to the policy choices, but now it's become relevant. You pull that off the shelf and start reusing it. That can all happen quite quickly. Okay, so um, we're happy to take comments or questions from the. Gonna, 
a lot of participants. So just to go back to these numbers, um, David, you, what do you think about the calculation? So you go into a 3% a output gap scenario and year on year PCE core would get a, you know into the low threes versus the linear model, it, it, would, it would kind of get into around 2.7, 2.6. Is that yeah, so the the nonlinear dealing with nonlinearities is is one of the um, one of the things that we need to worry about because those are the kind of things you can't do on the back of an envelope. You can't. We have to um, start building it into a model structure. Now you got to you got to reduce form model here, but uh, as we were just talking about before, one of the critical missing elements is the um, the assumptions you're making about the uh, non-responsiveness of in inflation formation, expectations formation. So the, uh, the, the, the idea that uh, it, it doesn't matter what happens to the world around them, people don't change their thinking and don't change their behavior. So starting to put in nonlinearities on top of nonlinearities, uh, it's very clear that you're gonna need to have some kind of a structured model process to be able to handle this. But it's also, it's also pretty clear that this is the world we have to think about these inflation surprises that you talked about, yes, clearly surprises in terms of the, uh, the discussion that the Fed was having with markets and with the public. Uh, so clearly surprises in terms of the baseline scenario and the range of um, alternative baselines that were revealed in the dot plots by no means surprises if you go back and ask, what do you think the range of possibilities were when you were going, you know, two years ago, a year ago, looking for, what's the range of possibilities for inflation outcomes in the United States? We don't know how fast uh, distance, the, 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 uh, this savings process, uh, you, you talked before about the buildup of uh, savings as revealed in cash balances. We don't know how fast those cash balances will run down as uh, the world starts to look a little bit more rosy or a little bit less dark. Uh, we don't know uh, how quickly the supply chains will be able to respond to sudden bursts of demand in various places. So uh, we've got some competing evidence on that from different uh, stories we're hearing about uh, microchips and industrial uh, parts and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, the possible uh, upward shocks to the inflation process that you would have been thinking about if you were thinking about what's a reasonable range of scenarios we'd want to discuss in policy risk terms would certainly have encompassed this. This would be no surprise in terms of uh, the uh, feasible set of outcomes that you would have been considering. Which is why it's important, I think, to uh, think in these terms and to communicate with the public in these terms. Okay, so it looks like uh, like we can wrap up here. Um, did you want to say anything else, or to prep people for next week? And do you want to give your bottom line away, or? 
Well, I think I've probably given the bottom line away already. Um, and I know it's, it's um, something of a uh, shift in the framing of the work that we need to do as policy analysts, policy economists. It's, we're, we're going to be using the same tools uh, as we've been using for years and years, building models that we were building for mainly forecasting purposes. But by shifting the framing, the use of those tools, we suddenly realize just how significant those tools are in order to be able to properly advise the policy decision makers on uh, the sorts of uh, alternatives that they need to think about when they're when they're thinking about their problem in policy risk terms. So it's not like we need to learn new things, but by shifting the emphasis, we're going to want to shift the emphasis also in terms of the staff that we will be employing, because we do want plenty of people, or as many people as we can get uh, within the budget that we've got, who are uh, have a facility with thinking in, uh, in macro model terms, because the, the model part will come to the fore much more uh, than all of the details of what this means for this sector or that sector. So that's the bottom line, um, something where we are, um, shifting the framing in a, what ultimately is going to be a very helpful way. My work, by the way, is in the recent years has been on uh, a, a lot on the governance issues confronting central banks on the question of the what is the um, place of the central bank uh, as an independent uh, executor of policy and maker of policy to some extent. One of the key issues uh, in that territory is the uh, public perception of the central bank in terms of whether it has a legitimacy to stand independent of the electoral process of electoral sanctions and pursuing um, a very important aspect of, of, of economic policy for governments. And to um, do that job well, uh, well, it's really important to do that job well in order to sustain public support for uh, the institutional arrangements that we have. By putting all of our eggs into a forecasting basket to frame things in terms of uh, our expertise is focused on producing a forecast, which is a high quality, uh, highly accurate thing or at least reasonably accurate when we uh, already know from experience that we can't do that, seems to be um, uh, dangerous uh, in terms of su sustaining public support for the central bank as an expert institution. To reframe the discussion in terms of what's policy trying to achieve and how will it achieve its goals in different worlds, worlds which we don't yet know, uh, we will be confronting uh, to frame the discussion with the public in those terms uh, has a far better chance of being helpful to people to understand the nature of the policy response that comes with the objectives that we've been given and uh, avoids painting ourselves as experts in areas where we cannot be expert. Okay, um, so thank you, David. Um, Do you have a question I think just came in? Okay, go ahead. Um, somebody was asking about what's the proxy for the output gap in different, um, different countries, I think was the question. Well, can you collect it? Um, I don't seem to, I don't see what you're seeing. Uh, it was a it was a chat question. Perhaps the person can maybe open their mic and ask the question directly, so you can hear it.
Uh, thank you for a very good presentation. I'm from the National Bank of Georgia. So my, my question about the uh, proxy, what do you use for the output gap as, um, uh, as proxy uh, for output in a Philips car? As, uh, we um, cannot use um, uh, HP filter. And also if we use um, Kalman filter, um, the uh, inf information about inflation is already in output gap. So um, my question is uh, so short. Yeah, it's one for you, I think, Doug. That's, uh, I think she, she addressed that to you, David. <laughs> yeah, but you're the expert in this area, so. Uh... So, so we're using um, the CBO, the Congressional Budget uh, Office's uh, measure of the of the uh, output gap. Uh, it has this disaggregated production function approach. Uh, the only reason that we used it was that it it was real, just a real simple example. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. but. If you uh, are interested, you can talk to your colleagues at the National Bank of Georgia who figured out how to do Coleman filtering when you have nonlinear uh, difference equations. And so what I would do is, um, you know, I would look at that, that stuff and see if we can start uh, estimating it in, in countries like the United States. My, my contribution to the discussion here would be uh, to emphasize that there are different ways of um, characterizing the intensity of supply constraints, of capacity constraints, and a, a range of um, calculation methods, estimation methods for the capacity constraint variable uh, would be advisable. Um, rather than trying to settle on one which beats all the others. Part of that, um, well, a lot of that's to do with that the, the, you know, we, really, we really don't know. Each of these is a, an estimate, and it can be a pretty bad estimate. Um, the um, Statistical Office in the United Kingdom has recently released some updated estimates of outputs, um, trends, uh, trends in total factor productivity, um, output from different sectors. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that a large part of the productivity puzzle that the UK was confronting was a statistical aberration. Uh, output had been growing uh, more slowly before the GFC than had previously been understood and was growing more rapidly since the GFC than had previously been understood. And so whatever filtering device you put on the official numbers being produced by the national statistician, uh, they were all going to be missing, missing the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the true picture. It might well have been better to focus on a different yes. um, measure of capacity constraint, maybe in the labor market, maybe in terms of survey measures of uh, stress on capacity, ability of, of uh, suppliers to increase their supply without having to raise their prices. These kind of um, alternatives for looking at the uh, output uh, or the supply side would be advisable. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Natasia, you have your hand up. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, I'm from the Bank of the France, uh, from the Forecast Division. And I would like to uh, know what kind of other models do you use within this projection policy analysis system? Because here, what we've seen is only a Phillips curve of one equation. But do you have other examples of different models? Yeah, so, so, uh, so for example, to analyze fiscal policy, okay? 
Um, so one of the models that we designed when I was at the fund, uh, which I think is the best thing out there for doing fiscal policy, uh, is a model called GIM. Okay, so if I'm thinking through a fiscal policy problem, I usually go to GIM multipliers and stuff like that. But, um, it's, a equilibrium. it's a general equilibrium model or? Yeah, it's a general, it's a DSG model. Did you? Okay. But what other models were you thinking about? Oh, I don't know. Because actually, before the meeting, I was thinking you would uh, more uh, talk about uh, semi structural models, big semi structural models. But uh, that's not yeah. models. For the so core. I think big, so, um, big semi structural models, I think, still are the are kind of the best game in town for policy modeling okay, as, as being a core model, okay? But for some countries you need, you actually need more structure to think through certain questions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I try to give the example of, of countries like Chile or Canada, where they export um, commodities. And so you need, there's a very strong correlation between oil prices and the Canadian dollar. Okay, so we're gonna have to explain that with a structural story, okay? Uh -huh. um, and so we need to have those, we, sometimes we need to have two core models to do that. But it depends on what the issues are that the center is facing. Okay. At the Banque de France, for example, what I one model I would be interested in um, would be, you know, how does my price level adjust given that I'm a member of a monetary union? So I guess that would be one way one way to think about a big question. Uh -huh. um, but also the implications of what we're talking about for the for the U.S. next week. Uh, and in fact, putting this PP um, um, system together is think about the productivity gains that all the Euro area system central banks would have if each one of them did this. In other words, if each one of them put together uh, a consistent uh, projection uh, just imagine how rich that debate would be about all the different possibilities and how they, you know, it could be factored into policy. Whereas if you go back to New Zealand or a small country like that, how many people does it take, David, in, in New Zealand to, to run everything? Yeah, I, I think uh, something, at least on 20 people, but somewhere in the order of 15 people. So it doesn't seem to take a, lot, a tremendous amount of people, but um, that's a very good question, Anastasia. Uh, okay, thank you for your answer. Okay. So I think the, the, the range of models that you're going to use is, is kind of as wide a set as you can handle within the resource constraints that you've got. Uh, and, and, and that makes sense. I mean, it, coming from the BIS, it would not be surprising for me to emphasize that the issues of treatment of financial cycles and financial shocks uh, would be something you'd want to at least have as part of your suite, um, something which gives you um, some financial dynamics. Now, it's unlikely that you're going to build a, a, a fairly large structural model which covers the financial shocks comprehensively as well. So this is why the suite of models approach does make sense. Uh, the, the problem with suites of models has been mostly a problem of model aggregation or forecast aggregation. Um, but that's a problem which we've created artificially by seeking to have a singular projection, which builds all the components in from different suites, for different models in the model suite. 
if instead you're looking at um, a suite of models in order to be able to process different kinds of shocks and be able to uh, understand the implications of different kinds of shocks for the policy choices you're going to have to make, there's much less need for integration of the outputs of different model processes. You're much freer to be able to explore models which have special purposes. So the suites can be richer. Good. So, um, so thanks, David, for uh, for all your generous use of your time, and uh, thank thanks to the rest for joining us in this in this session. We'll see you. Uh, next week. Bye-bye. Um,